Um, good afternoon. <laughs> I should have been wearing my heels. <laughs> it's too short. And uh, anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a nice thing. Excellent. Yeah, sorry. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And, and thanks um, to Emily, so I can see um, for the invitation um, to be part of this um, conversation. Um, sorry, we got a bit lost <laughs> coming here, uh, which explains why we're late. Um, it's um I didn't I didn't get to hear the previous speaker's um um keynotes and some of the things that he highlighted, but I'm sure there's quite a lot of um intersections and um overlap in terms of things that I would like to talk about. Um so let me start with some observations that I think would be critical for a conference on land, especially as we are also in a, I'd say in a context, um, a, a kind of global land that is fraught with conflicts, fraught with um, tension, and I would also say um, several other crises, all of which have implications for land. Um, one of the things I would like to say, because when we talk about land, I was part of an IPCC report um, way back, um, but when we talk about land, um, we, we often talk about it in terms of food systems. <laughs> we talk about it in terms of food security. We talk about it in terms of investment. Um, but I'm also wanting to appreciate that land is also about civilization. You know, land is about identity. Land is about culture. Um, so it's also important that we extend um, our lens um, to not just issues around economy, um, um, issues about um, um, political economy also, but also to look at it from that sort of cultural perspective, which I think is also fundamentally important, um, especially since um, I'd say uh, one of our key findings in that IPCC report is land um, is coming under a great deal of pressure, uh, multiple demands um, in terms of land. And very often when we're thinking about the whole sort of aspect of climate change um, and how we adapt to how we mitigate, we often look at the energy sector being that sort of main culprit um, as a way of how we get out of the crisis. But we don't sort of go back to looking at land um, and to see what are the, some of the solutions that we can take advantage of uh, related to land. So, so land, I think, is, um, um, has uh, quite a lot of potential um, to offer a way out of this, um, out of this conflict um, and out of this, um, this crisis. Let me zoom in to the African situation and African context um, and why land is um, um, increasingly important. Now, land systems in Africa, um, to a large extent, have been shaped by colonial um, legacy, historical legacy. Um, I would say also to a large extent, customary practices, land tenure arrangements, all of these are part of the system uh, that we have inherited. And, and to a large extent, we have to walk along these systems, along these governance systems, to be able to understand um, issues around land. Um, Land is a resource in Africa. Land is a resource because we have a predominantly agrarian population and a lot of people depend on land, land for livelihoods, um, land for income, um, and land for a whole range of other things as well. Um, so, as I said before, as we're looking at it from that sort of climate perspective, important for us to look at it through both a problem and a solution. Um, and we are not, um, I'd say, taking advantage of the intersection between adaptation and mitigation in terms of how we can um, mine uh, this resource of land. We, we often look at it, land 
as in adaptation, but there is um, mitigation value um, and a strong mitigation per, um, potential where land is concerned. So that I think is also important that we look at. Um, I mentioned the fact also that land, as I said before, is coming under a lot of, a lot, a lot of um, demand. And that demand is also comes with its fair share of stress um, and fair share of um, um, difficulties, I would say, um, particularly for smallholder families. Um, I would also say the more we're looking towards a net zero ambition, a net zero trajectory, the more land is seen as an attractive investment, because obviously for our renewable energy in terms of storage, um, some of these other critical green minerals that we're talking about um, offer also some degree of, you know, the, the we need battery storage, etc. And so how we can begin to plan taking advantage of land, um, um, this increased demand for land, I think um, is going to be fundamentally, fundamentally important. Um, the other thing to mention also is that climate change to me is just a threat multiplier. There are other problems with land and um, there are other severe, I would say, um, hardwired problems. Um, structural problems that are related to land. So climate change is just an exacerbating factor um, in Africa. Um, this is also a continent where we see a yield deficit, right? Um, and this is a continent also a region where there are still people that are at the risk um, of um, both mal malnutrition, um, you know, uh, and hunger. Um, and it's it's particularly worrying because um, we are looking at um, population increase uh, with African um, population increasing 2.3 billion. Um, and with that increase, there is more pressure on land. So I think it's becoming um, even more critical that we do something about land. The other thing that is also difficult um, to sort of um, understand is that we, we talk about Africa having or, or being home to 60% 60 60 of the world's arable land. But yes, this is a continent that is a net importer of food. Um, Africa continues to import food um, from the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, spending over $80 billion um, dollars annually, uh, which could increase as well um, to $100 billion. Um, in terms of food imports. So that is a, that is a problem. The, the main problem, I would say, is the fact that smallholder farmers who are increasingly reliant um, on um, land systems um, find themselves with several, as I mentioned before, structural deficits, uh, but are unable to take advantage of some of the um, solutions that would come with um, sustainable land management, or this whole aspect of subsidies, which is a problem for them because it means that um, a Sahelian farmer um, can produce milk um, and that milk is cheaper. Um, it's cheaper to buy milk that's imported than it is to buy the milk that the Sahelian farmer is producing. Um, and so that's, that, that speaks to the um, you know, perverse subsidies that is part of the system um, of um, our food and supply chain. Um, we've seen how with the Russian and Ukrainian conflict, how that had a massive impact um, on African farmers um, because of this heavy uh, reliance, I'd say, and dependency um, on, um, um, on weeds, um, on grains, on fertilizers, and how this in turn um, really has affected um, the food and supply chain. We've seen a lot of price hikes. Um, and many farmers and um, ordinary citizens could not afford um, um, basic food supplies, basic food commodities. So the, they, the, the vulnerability in the food system um, became even more, um, became exacerbated, I'd say, with um, the Ukrainian um, crisis. But that's probably not the only aspect of it in terms of geopolitics. Increasingly, what we're seeing is African governments that are leasing lands 
um, and I would say prime lands to foreign investors. Um, and so that sort of lease of land um, has got a lot of implications as well um, for smallholder farmers, because it means that the most fertile land, the best land is leased um, to um, um, investors that have got the purchasing power to basically um, um, take advantage of the land and produce on that land. And sometimes even the returns on investment has not invested back into those societies where land is, um, uh, is lead. So that, that, that's another structural problem. Um, and that problem also is about equity um, in terms of access to land, who has access um, and how is this access, you know, um, how does the access enable food production? Um, and that, 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 as I said before, um, speaks to the whole aspect, I would say, of matters relating, related to land sovereignty. Um, one of the things to, to ask that is, in as much as we're talking about a way towards net zero, going towards low carbon development, I fundamentally think that none of that can be achieved if we don't take land and food systems into the equation. So our potential to become resilient um, is very much anchored on our potential to build land-based resilience um, to support small farmer holders um, and to ensure that the tools that they need, the resources that they need are resources that are accessible. Our food systems in itself is somewhat dysfunctional uh, because if you think about it with the example that I've given, that people have got the resources, but they don't also have the resources to add value. Uh, if you think about an average Ethiopian farmer would have to produce coffee, um, and that copy is being um, exported out um, and the Ethiopian farmer or average farmer would be charged for extra for just um, supplying the green copy as it is. Um, it would be cheaper to add value to that copy in other parts of the world. It'd be cheaper to add value to that um, to other parts um, that values added to that green coffee um, in other other regions um, in Geneva, in Amsterdam, in Paris, etc. Um, and that's a double equity issue because it means that one of the small called the farmer is being denied access to the inputs and the elements of commercialization. Um, but secondly, also, it means that the, the added value or the value add, um, the profits are being sort of taken away from that farmer because somebody else is enjoying the profits of having um, coffee and adding value to those um, green coffees. So uh, those are just some of, the, some of the, um, the difficulties and the hardships that we're seeing uh, with, regards, with regards to land. Um, I think what I'm seeing from where I sit um, is the increasing need to begin to think about um, how do we bring smallholder farmers into this solution space? Um, because I think as much as we talk about aspects of equity and justice, um, that will not come full circle unless the smallholder farmer is part of the equation. But it's also very important looking at supply chains to say, how do you support farmers in producing closer to where the value chains are? Because that then means that we are reducing the impacts of um, emissions, um, climate change emissions. But it also means that the smallholder farmer is much closer um, to the value chain. Um, and that's also very important. The structural problems, um, some of this is not related to climate change. But I think climate change offers us an opportunity to really begin to see how we address the issues related to storage uh, that smallholder farmers are facing, um, address the issues of um, grains and fertilizers, which are a huge problem uh, that the farmers are facing, um, and also address some of these nexus problem between um, the, our food system and our energy system as well. 
um, because at a, at a time when we are looking at matters related to um, fossil fuel and uh, fossil fuel production, and where we're basically saying that we probably need to do away with natural gas, um, we must also think about natural gas can is is a you know a, a way in to fertilize, um, and when we we stop natural gas, um, then it means that um, that production and that supply of fertilizers um, is also stopped. Um, so we must find ways of thinking uh, along this um, um, potential difficulties of how do farmers have access uh, to some of these. Um, um, specific, I'll say, tools and ingredients that they need. Uh, there's a trade aspect, uh, which I think is also very important. Um, there's the African continental free trade area, um, fundamentally essential, the potential to bring um, close to 1.3 billion people. Um, it could be the, the largest market, um, but at the same time, that also has to be developed in terms of trade infrastructure. But the idea is that because African countries are not trading with themselves, that link is sometimes not there. But obviously, if the links were in place, um, then it would support um, better investments. Countries can trade within themselves, um, and they're not going to be um, hamstrung by um, taxes and some of the um, asymmetries, the power asymmetries that we're seeing now on the global market. So how we we develop more um, secure and stable mechanisms, uh, supply chain resilience, I think, uh, would be important to, to have a very direct link uh, with suppliers. I think um, that again is important. Um, I've talked about the issue of how land is increasingly outsourced to foreign investors. Um, so I don't want to talk about that too much, but it is a problem that uh, governments are looking more and more to Chinese investors, foreign investors, to um, buy land. And as I said before, some of these returns on investment is not fed back uh, into um, land reforms. Um, this is also a continent which I think um, has seen the green industrial revolution come and go. You know, the, it's almost as if it's a continent where we've been talking about um, the agrarian um, transition for a long time. And it seems that that agrarian transition in itself um, has not produced the results that we expected um, in Africa. So um, to, to that extent, we would say that, um, as I mentioned before, the climate change for me is just another big threat. It's another um, exacerbating factor. Um, the fact also that ex extensive agriculture has left um, sufficient, I mean, subsistence farmers, I would say, worse off, is a legacy of colonialism. The more we look at aspects of production uh, and overproduction, even to some extent, the more I would say that that leaves a certain, um, a, a certain um, um, number of people dispossessed of their lands. Um, there's a lot of land grabbing um, in Africa. It's a huge problem. Um, and the more these people are left without the resources, the key resources that they need um, to be able to make that land productive. The, the, the biggest problem I see in, in this whole conversation about climate change is not about land itself. It's about how you increase the productive capacity of farmers, right? And, and as I mentioned before, the Green Revolution is essentially about creating the right context, the right business environment, um, improved, um, I would say, um, crop yields, etc. Make um, increasing the potential of um, irrigable land um, or irrigation. Um, those things have not happened quite at the scale that one expected to have it to happen. So there is quite a lot to do with some of those structural problems, even before we talk about climate change. Uh, we do have a tendency to conflate everything to climate change. But we should also bear in mind that, you know, land has been a problem in terms of structural difficulties, structural inequities for a long time. Um, and I haven't even talked about the issue of gender and how that has also um, um, basically disempowered uh, women. Uh, there are many smallholder farmers that are women 
Um, when it comes to issues around climate information services, many of these women are not able to take advantage of that. They're not able to make strategic decisions about when to plant, where to plant. Um, the, 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 the kind of data that they need that would give them anticipatory planning to be able to ensure that they are basically taking advantage of those that knowledge is often not there. Um, so that again is, uh, um, is, is another important um, um, point to raise. Um, maybe let me just close um, to um, just highlight that land is under stress. That's a given. It's under stress because we have these multiple demands. It's a contested resource as we, as we speak. Um, and Africa has become somewhat of a new terrain for that contestation and that contestation will increase. Um, we have seen the countries that had a very strong potential in terms of agricultural potential have lost that potential because they have gone heavily into mining. Um, so the more we're looking at mining and you know, anything that involves an extractive economy, the more we're losing that potential of land as a resource. Uh, because however much we try to go towards sustainable land management or mining sustainably, there are still problems, you know, um, we have to think about regenerative ways of using um, land and, and that's not happening. Somebody I know once said to me that when you think about it in terms of poverty, the biggest problem we have is not poverty as, as such, it's, it's soil infertility. Um, basically, soils are not what they used to be. Um, and that constant degradation, constant erosion um, of soil nutrients um, is something that we need to have almost a radical overhaul of how do we deal with this. Because as long as this is absent, it means that farmers do not have the potential um, to take advantage of land and to do so in the way that matters. So, so that's um, an important thing that we need to do. Um, there, there, are, there are opportunities around um, carbon sequestration, um, and those are fantastic opportunities. Um, there, are, uh, there are even discussion around um, carbon dioxide removal and how we do that. And obviously land is going to come um, into the equation when we're thinking about that. Um, but, but I think it's important, even as we're thinking about those opportunities, to think about how we take advantage of making the land more productive. Um, so that we don't blind sight on some of the, the bigger structural problems that are there um, and, and we reduce that to a mitigation problem. Land offers us opportunity for adaptation and mitigation, but right now the more the biggest priority that African countries have is adaptation and how we can make land um, more aligned to adaptation practices um, is also fundamentally important. How we make land fit for purpose for food security to ensure that we have a healthy ecosystem is also important. Um, let me finish with the, the last point I wanted to make, which is around um, this whole business of um, our green minerals. Um, I tend to have this tendency to say, when it comes to low carbon development, I fundamentally believe that Africa is already home to a lot of the resources that are necessary for low carbon development, and land is an important one. Um, but we also have huge amounts of endowments in terms of a number of these um, green minerals. Um, and I think that as we're thinking about further investments that could be had, we also need to think about um, people because we can't think about investments and markets if we do not think about people. Um, so the, the, the history hasn't been very, um, it hasn't been very positive because uh, as I often say, uh, many of these resources have been part of an enclave economy and people haven't benefited. So I think it's important that as we're talking about green minerals, that we bring it back to center and, and the center or finding that center is ensuring that um, soft, um, um, subsistence farming is given the relevant um, uh, support and the small part farmer holders are given the relevant support. Given the relevant support in terms of the land reforms that we need to make, 
in terms of tools, fertilizers, grains, uh, but also in terms of knowledge. Um, knowledge transfer is critical. Um, farmers um, in Africa and developing world, I'd say, are very often taken um, uh, uh, by surprise by the, the shocks that they're not able to insulate themselves from. Um, so these external shocks um, are happening at a rate that is faster than they can cope with. So the, 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 the solutions that we bring to the table, I think, is going to be um, fundamentally important. And how we do that with people um, would, be, would, be, um, would be critical. So um, um, again, um, coming back to this issue of inequality um, and climate change is to ensure that um, we're not just looking at inequality as you know, um, a, a government in Ethiopia or government in Zambia selling land or leasing land to Chinese investors or to European investors, but there is in-country inequality. There is such a thing as a political elite um, that can also take advantage um, of land opportunities, um, take advantage of investment opportunities, and then leave um, populations, farmers, a little bit um, stranded. Um, so we need to also make sure that we, we look at in inequality and we look at issues around justice in the broadest form um, and not just focus is on um, this is something that is done to people and that happens across cross border uh, problems within countries these inequalities are also right thank you very much thank you Fatima for a very different but also in a way we touch upon similar issues at Mark. But, uh, we have a few minutes left for questions. So if there are some questions, then uh, raise your hand. We still have two red shirted volunteers with microphones. So there's a question over there from the gentleman. You will be second. Uh, could you? Yeah. Thank you for the <laughs> Thank you. I think we're taking a you, can, you have a, a question that links to two questions at a time, maybe. The light should be off. Thank you. 
the software fit for all this and profile policies the DNA comes today. And the other most important level of governance is that of the people on the ground. Because every time you see African nations, it's not only for those that go for or even for people in Africa. They are always having in there. But when it comes to social accountability about what needs to happen in terms of um, we talk about um, uh, increasing capacity, economic capacity, and so on, which is for true, to do value um, enhancing products, they do not have this kind of data. So I think that would go the rich speed. Um, we need to capacitate these communities to all the enlighten them on the activities to hold their partners, to hold their entities responsible to their campaign policies, also hold them responsible to the policies that are in place. So that we can get a very strong movement for that change. I feel they can be um, responsible for that governance. And I hope Okay. Okay, so so let me let me address um some of these questions. Um I want to go back to the gentleman from Zambia and maybe just challenge the motion. I, I actually didn't mention capitalism. I actually talked about colonialism, but I think that these are all sort of um, analogs, if you like, <laughs> of the same thing. Um, it's, it's really difficult to, to sort of just look at this as a now thing. And, and I hope that that's not what I was saying. Um, because when you go back to the colonial projects, the colonial project was also about production, right? And it was product production for um, colonial metropoles, right? So subsistence farming was, was discouraged to a large extent. It wasn't given the support that it needed. So we're operating from that perspective. That system has followed through. And the new elites that have come through have not necessarily changed the system. So in that sense, I'd agree with you that our governance structures are weak, right? And part of addressing the problem is in ensuring that we have a governance structure that is fit for purpose um, and a governance structure that can be challenged. Um, so that at least, um, you know, the support to smallholder families um, can, be, can be done using the governance um, and the governance system as, a, as an entry point. Um, but when you talk about issues around land grabbing um, and um, a whole, you know, uh, communities do not have the opportunity to challenge this. Um, and, and this is done um, not in very transparent ways to foreign investors. You know, that also has um, to a large extent, capitalist tendencies um, that in many ways do not support um, smallholder farmers. So, so these things, I don't think you can um, divorce or disassociate them from their root causes of a story of dispossession, right? A story of exclusion. Um, and, uh, and the story is made worse because we now have other bigger problems, other outliers like climate change that are there that we have to look at. Um, the the question about women that um, that um, Julia raised, um, I think it's a it's it's one of the core problems um, of agriculture, especially in terms of productivity, because um, women and farmers, you know, are in the millions, but um, they don't often they they're often in the front line, even in terms of the impacts of climate change, 
And one of the most important resources that they need is information. Um, climate information is very often missing um, because there are power plays and power dynamics as well. And that as, as a woman farmer, I may not get the information relevant to really understand what are the um, patterns of weather that I need to take advantage of to be able to see what to plant, how to plant and where to plant. Um, so th th there's been a lot of cooperatives and farmers school, I think, uh, which are essential to the learning process, uh, but it's still nearly not enough. Uh, whenever there is a big initiative um, in many parts of Africa where women are involved, some of their male um, counterparts will come in and muscle in and those profits would be, would be taken away. So I think we haven't found a solution for how to support women, but we haven't found a solution also for how to support disenfranchised men in the system. There is, there is an issue of disenfranchised men that we have to take advantage of, so we have to, um, we have to accept. Um, so women have all kinds of problems from storage um, to problems related to energy processing device. Um, that they might need also um, to problems related to market, to infrastructure, how they move their goods from a point of production to a point of delivery or commercialization. So those are all issues uh, that are heavily weighted against women. Um, and the more we're talking about extreme events, especially in terms of just insurance, having the insurance culture 